let's take a look at the global pandemic numbers now. Stay away from crowds, stay home as much as you can. The CDC has confirmed this is the first case in the country. Houses of worship essential. A remnant is rising. Welcome to the Watchman's Corner. This is your host, Jeremiah Johnson. I'm excited today to bring to you a message broadcast live from around our nation. You know, in the midst of COVID-19, God is seeking a radical remnant calling us to the front lines of the battle. I know that you'll be blessed by today's message and I encourage you to hang in there after this message for a special time of prayer. Check it out. Come on, let's give Jesus one more shout of praise. Has anybody ever seen the movie Gladiator? Folks around the nation ask me, what's it like over there at Fresh Start Church? I said it's like a Pentecostal Coliseum where they slay demons. Come on, you entered a coliseum where no demon in hell is safe in this place. God is raising up an end time army, amen. Can we give the worship team a round of applause? <laughs> All right, you can be seated. It's a true joy and honor to be with you this morning. We had an opportunity to fly in early for this conference and just be able to receive. How many of you have received so well from Isaiah and Sean and Pastor Kilpatrick, Brother Russell, just incredible. Pastor, thank you so much. That message, uh, honestly, was probably my favorite so far. Touched me deeply. I have all the feels uh, at this conference as someone who pastored full time for 12 years and has also traveled. And I know the price that it requires in part to steward revival on a local and regional level. Uh, a lot easier just to fly around and drop bombs and leave. And so there's been so many pastors and leaders here and I know by experience just the real fight that it takes. A lot of these conferences, it's exciting, and then the last day you're sort of depressed because you have to go back and try to figure out what to do with all of this. So you, you have my condolences, and I'll be praying with you and for you. Uh, I know half of you really just want to farm this worship team and half these people out of here, you know, recruiting in the lobby. But you know what? God has a place and a space of people for you where you live. And I uh, just want to encourage you sincerely that God is with you and he's going to show you exactly what he's asking you to do. And then finally, if you call Fresh Start Church home, I hope that you know that you're blessed. I hope that you know that God is doing something special. I want to honor Pastor Kim and Paul, the sacrifice in this house. There's precious oil here. Amen. If you have in your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 3. I want to preach a message this morning concerning the new era that we are entering into in the body of Christ. And part of the new era that we're entering into is concerning a great civil war 
that is going to take place in the church. I believe that this civil war in many ways has been fought through many decades, but the battle is going to grow very fierce and very intense. I believe the intensity of this civil war that I speak of is literally going to be like Elijah uh, when he calls fire down on Mount Carmel. It's literally going to be which God do you serve? And so the civil war is going to be concerning the doorkeepers of revival and the doorkeepers of religion. We are here at the Doorkeepers of Revival Conference, but I want you to know that there are many doorkeepers of religion in America. And just as fiercely and intensely, you and I are called to guard the door of, rev of revival, making sure that only certain realities get through the door. There are many in this nation who guard the door of religion, and they don't want you and I to pass through. And my encouragement for you today is that God is releasing a holy jailbreak from the spirit of religion in America. There are chains that are breaking even now. Barna survey suggesting that one in three are not watching online and have no desire to go back to church after COVID-19. There has been a mass exposure in the American church concerning where our foundation truly lies. And so in Acts chapter 3 here, we're going to see a collision between two doorkeepers of revival, Peter and John, and a lame crippled beggar who is our doorkeeper of religion. There's a collision here in the scriptures that I believe is symbolic of the collision that's happening in our nation. Now before we jump in there, I want to confess some things to you for about two minutes. Wow, that was awkward. Wow, okay. Don't worry, my wife is watching. I have accountability. I had a supernatural birth experience. An angel of the Lord came to my mom in her womb and told her to name me Jeremiah. I began dreaming around seven years old. I was really blessed to grow up in a father, a pastor's uh, environment um, where what we said we believed in, we saw. In other words, part of the blessing or inheritance that I personally was a part of is one of the only fights my dad ever had with the board was the services being too long. Start at 10, end at 3 p.m. kind of thing. So I grew up in a supernatural environment. Do you believe in tongues? Yes, then you speak in tongues. Do you believe in healing? Yes. Then you pray for healing. More of what Isaiah mentioned. And so I grew up in this supernatural environment where the gifts, uh, the charismatic expression, Pentecostalism was embraced. We were unashamed. It wasn't a prideful, arrogant thing. It was just more like, hey, I mean, if you're spirit filled, then are you really spirit filled? Where are the manifestations of it? And I never really encountered a religious devil until I went to Bible college. I attended the largest Pentecostal university in this nation. And honestly, that was my first experience being around young people who said that they believed in one thing, but there was no evidence of it in their life. 
I was very discouraged and I was very heartbroken at this kind of encounter. I had no idea that my experience of church was completely different than their experience of church. And so I was there on the campus for a number of years and I took a course called homiletics in order to graduate. And part of my confession to you is that I failed the course. Now, I got an A in terms of actually preaching, but I failed the class because you had to submit as your final paper a 52-week sermon series. It was communicated to us that as you grow as pastors and leaders, you plan out a year in advance. And so I needed to pray and basically line up some series that I could turn into the professor. And I made a really bad mistake, and the mistake was I asked the Holy Spirit what He wanted to do. And so I turned in a 52-week sermon series and wrote, Holy Spirit, and turned it in. And I flunked the course. How many of you in here have flunked religion, but you've passed on revival? Come on, how many of you are tired of the dead, the dry, the stale? How many of you know sermonettes produce Christianettes? We need the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit to return. Come on, somebody turn to your neighbor and say, give me something hot. Give me something fresh. So when my wife and I graduated and we planted a church... I was like the worst sermon series guy. Our elder team tried to convince me that we needed to do topic kind of things. And I do, I do believe if you're a leader, a pastor in here, and you're a sermon series guy, God bless you. When I talk about today, God breathing, I believe God wants to breathe life into a religious system, what I'm not meaning by that is stop preaching the Word, okay? Because the Bible, it says that the Word of God is God-breathed. I'm not saying we need less Bible in the church, but the difference between anointed teachers and teachers is teachers give you information. Anointed teachers, they inject a love for the truth inside of you. We need more anointed teaching in the body of Christ that erupts a love for the truth. And so I had my work cut out for me, church planning, and then when the Lord called me to travel, it got even worse. I began to go to Assemblies of God. I began to go to Pentecostal denominations. And because I loved revival history, I would preach on Azusa Street. And as I preached on Azusa Street and Pentecostal pastors would ask me, what's that? I knew we were in trouble. You know, as a young guy, a lot of times when you tell people there's a new thing coming, they think you're arrogant. So I stopped telling the Pentecostal church there's a new thing coming and I just started telling them God is taking you back to your roots. There's an inheritance so it sort of snuck me in the door with this old time message and then they would become enraged when I would challenge the fact that in many of our charismatic Pentecostal expressions the ministry of the Holy Spirit has been relegated to a sign out by the road. There's actually nothing spirit-filled really going on in the services, although I'm Pentecostal and charismatic. And so I was in a season where I was continuing to preach on Pentecost, on the power of the Holy Spirit, so many of these things. And honestly, I was greatly discouraged. And a guy by the name of Isaiah Saldivar said, Have you ever heard of Fresh Start Church in Peoria, Arizona? And I said, No, who are they? He sent me a video clip, and from that day forward, I prayed to God that he would give me the opportunity to preach in this church one day. So this is a real honor 
and a real privilege for me that there are people here gathered today that are actually walking the walk and not just talking the talk. There are doorkeepers of revival here. So when I asked God what was the mandate of fresh start for the nation, the Lord said to me, the mandate in this house for the nation is to awaken the sleeping giant who is the church and to make war on the religious spirit. I believe that this house has a mantle and it's being extended to many who gather here on weekends to awaken the sleeping giant who is the church and to make war on the religious spirit. God is releasing a spirit of awakening in America to a sleeping church. Now, many of them are not sleeping. They're like the church at Sardis. They have an appearance of being alive, but really they're dead. Every program known to man, every opportunity, all those things, but really spiritually, they're dead on the inside. And so I believe that today, on the final day of the conference, God wants to introduce us to this clash, this civil war concerning the doorkeepers of revival and doorkeepers of religion, and then give us an opportunity to choose a side. And I believe more than even choosing a side, God wants to raise up individuals in this house that are actually going to penetrate the power of religion with the fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Last confession, I promise. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, I believe, never knew how dry and stale their system was. The people that followed them, they never understood until Jesus came and demonstrated the power of God. It was only until they had something to compare their doorkeeper of religion that they could actually wake up and see the truth. And so my final confession to you is, I believe that there could be some people in here that you have a PhD in pointing out the spirit of religion while simultaneously you have no plans of defeating it. You're one of these generals on Facebook. You know, like these general prophets and intercessors on Facebook who love to rebuke and love to moan and complain about how dry and stale their city or their church is, failing to realize unless you give yourself to become the difference, they don't have an opportunity to compare it. And so again, much easier to point the finger, much easier to say your city is dry rather than actually plant a house of revival. I believe when we talk about making war on the religious spirit, it's more than a Facebook status. It's actually callousing your knees. It's actually paying a price to become what you long to see in your region somebody shout amen I think some people want a refund on the material out there now Lord awaken the sleeping giant your church in America teach us how to make war on the religious spirit Acts chapter 3, I want to begin reading in verses 1 through 10, and then we're going to break it down. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer.
And a certain man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began to asking to receive alms. And Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze upon him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. And with a leap he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I'm telling you there's a breakthrough coming to the doorkeepers of religion. And they were there taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I believe that this first encounter that Peter and John have after being filled with the fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 is representative oftentimes when someone or a church gets powerfully touched by the Holy Spirit immediately in front of them becomes a challenge. There becomes a collision. Has the Lord ever told you to fast and then mama comes in and makes the best meal? A lot of times when someone gets powerfully delivered, that Jezebel's sister who you dated calls you out of nowhere. There's an immediate attack that oftentimes follows powerful moves of God. And Peter and John, as doorkeepers of revival, being fresh, being filled with the fresh power of the Holy Spirit, automatically encounter a lame beggar who we're going to find out in a moment, I believe, was a doorkeeper of religion. When we look at this story, I have in my Bible, uh, Acts 3.1, now Peter and John, I have here now products of revival. Now gatekeepers, doorkeepers of revival were going up to the temple at the ninth hour of prayer. And a certain man, my translation JJ's is, and a doorkeeper of religion who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful religion. in order to beg alms of those who are entering the temple. If you're taking notes, I've done some extensive research. I felt it was really important for a moment to talk about this location. It says that the lame beggar who's a doorkeeper of religion, he sat at the temple gate called Beautiful probably every day for a number of years. We're going to read in a moment in chapter 4. He was more than 40 years old when he was healed, okay? So this individual sat at this gate. Now, if you look in history, the nine gates, temple gate called Beautiful isn't mentioned. Most scholars will agree probably it's the double gate. But this gate positionally was very important because through this specific gate, it led to the court of the women. Through this specific gate, it led to the trumpet-shaped boxes where they would give offerings Through this specific gate, there was teaching 
beyond it. And so when we think about the temple gate called beautiful, or for our time today, the temple gate called religion, we have to recognize that the crippled beggar was strategically positioned at a very important spot. And where he was positioned would have given him the opportunity in his lifetime to be around several important things that you might remember. For example, when Simeon and Anna dedicated baby Jesus, they probably would have had to walk through the beautiful gate because the court of the women was right behind it. It's not a far stretch to know the crippled beggar being about 40, Jesus dies around 33, that probably as a boy lame, the crippled beggar would have seen Jesus being carried in the temple and being dedicated. You might remember Jesus going into the temple and throwing out the money changers. The boxes for the offerings were right behind the temple gate called beautiful. You might remember Jesus as a boy, 12, teaching in the temple. He would have passed right by the lame, crippled beggar. Why is the location of this beautiful gate called religion so important? Because somehow, some way, this lame, crippled beggar had experienced all that the church of his day had to offer, yet he remained bound. And there is a generation in the church like the lame crippled beggar who have had a front row seat to every program, every preacher. I heard that, seen that, read that. They have a PhD in religion, but they've never actually experienced the power of God for themselves. And notice the spirit of religion that is upon this crippled beggar. The spirit of religion is always demanding payment. Give me an alms. Let it be a contract. Just come in and out. Religion demands payment, but revival offers the power of God. It was just another day in the cripple, the doorkeeper of religion, just another day going through the motions looking for a handout. And he asked Peter and John for money. In other words, he's out of touch with his true need. People bound in religion are out of touch for their true need for an intimate encounter with the Son of God. More than outward behavior modification and going through the motions. If we're going to get free from the power of religion, we must say yes to the spontaneous workings of the Holy Spirit when He comes upon us. See, religion restrains, but revival brings an outpouring. Religion restrains, but revival brings resurrection. God wants to release resurrection power to parts of the American church who are drunk on programs. They're drunk on pre-planned. The power of religion is born in routine. So many services are over before they begin. And part of this dead dry, stale, going through the motions, religion comes to maim you. 
Religion comes to constrain you. It comes to paralyze you. It comes to castrate you. It comes to paralyze you. Many of us were saved through a radical encounter and baby, we worked great for the devil. B.C., before Christ, we were out at the club. We were up all night. We wouldn't get out of the club till 4 a.m., but then we get born again and church has to be an hour. It's like we serve the devil way better in our past than we've ever served Jesus Christ now. And religion has come to silence and to polish and to shut down an emerging breed of firebrands. I'm telling you, part of this new era that's about to hit the body of Christ is the fire is going to burn so hot that in some places resurrection will come but in other places it's time for new plants and new models and new houses of prayer some of you might be called to go and infiltrate but many of you are called to birth something new well oh, brother i just can't move to that city my parents live there and it's free babysitting for the kids and brother, I, I, I can't leave that church. You know, it's my friends and no, it's our love for the comfortable and the convenient that actually is louder than our hunger for revival. Questions been asked all week. How hungry are you? There's a civil war that's coming to America. The doorkeepers of revival are going to clash with the doorkeepers of religion. And I'm prophesying to you who's going to win. My prophecy for you today is this. Peter and John are about to come to the American church. Peter and John are about to come to the American church. And I'm going to break that down in a moment. Can I tell you that part of revival and experiencing all that God has for you doesn't have to look like you being miserable? I'm convinced that we have a hard time getting people saved because they're looking at our faces. I don't know where we bought into this Christian experience where it's like we try to hold on in church feeling like what we're missing out on out there when I prophesy to you days are coming to the church where people out there are going to wonder what they're missing out on in here. There is a joy. Amen. There is a happiness. But this miserable thing, this depress this I'm just as bound 20 years in as I was 20 years ago I believe the church is reaching a tipping point God if this is all there is I'm done I want to encourage you further down that line like I want you to walk the plank with me like I, I want you to walk the plank and dare to jump out of the pool of religion. That broken cistern, that old wineskin. God is saying to so many intercessors and prophets and faithful, how long will you mourn for Saul? I believe in this quarantine season, God has intentionally separated many people from their soul to help them to wake up and recognize that, wow, it's a lot hotter in the prayer closet than it's ever been in the house of God. Wow, the Spirit's breaking out in my living room, but I have to sit through a drive through every Sunday, and it's doing nothing for my marriage, nothing for my family. 
I want to say to a generation of Samuels, lift up your head because Peter and John are coming to the church. There's an intimacy, there's a boldness, there's a power, there's realms of faith that are coming that are going to disrupt the religious system. Revival comes to release, it comes to empower, it comes to refresh, it comes to resurrect, it's spontaneous. Religion loves routine because it can be controlled. So there was a clash. The location of the beautiful gate is very important because the crippled beggar had spent his entire life having a PhD in every song and every program, but yet he still lacked an encounter. I've shared with you before, I have a brother in a federal prison serving a long-term sentence, grew up in a similar atmosphere as I did. What happened? He chose to know about God rather than know God. It's possible, saints, even in these kinds of atmospheres of revival to start operating in a yuza anointing. Will you get so comfortable with the presence of God, you're stuck in a religious system and a wineskin called revival. I believe that following the Holy Spirit, being born again, was intended to be one of the greatest adventures that you and I have ever been on. I believe that it should be the most fun and the most scary journey you have ever taken. Choosing to take your hands off your life off your church is one of the greatest liberators where we actually die to self and allow the Spirit of Christ to live through us. Now I know as a pastor how to try it. I was praying even about this morning through my own experiences because Again, it's one thing to talk about the move of the Spirit in a church, and it's another thing to be a leader and have to face those hard decisions. And I remember our church plant in Lakeland, Florida, was about three or four years in, and it was an Easter service or, you know, Creasters, those folks that just go to church on Sunday and Wednesday. And a lot of folks in the congregation began to beg me around Easter to tone it down because they wanted to bring their friends and family. You know, could you make it a little bit more comfortable so people won't get offended? And there was something, a wrestle. I know so many great people. You love the Lord. You're hungry for revival, but your greatest enemies to the things of God are your friends and family. It's the pressures around you. God wants to sharpen you, but religion is trying to polish you off. So we had gone to a restaurant, and the Lord previous to that said, Jeremiah, I want you to invite this missionary on Easter Sunday. I can't say his name publicly, but I can tell you he's on Al-Qaeda's most wanted list. For real. This is a missionary when he gives altar calls. It's not, do you want to come to the Lord? It's, do you want to be a martyr? It's like, you know, we have our sermon illustrations. This guy is, well, I was stoned by Muslims out in the village for preaching the gospel, okay? Basically, he makes preachers feel not saved. And the Lord says, I want you to bring him on Easter Sunday. And as a young pastor, I'm like, oh, God. So a couple days before the gathering, my wife and I went out to eat. We were sitting in this restaurant. I might have told this story here before. But there was a waitress that came up and just introduced herself and said that she had the gift of reading people. And immediately my wife began to kick me in the shin. 
and it didn't hurt enough. And so I said, that's great. I have that gift too. Why don't you try your gift of reading people and then I'll try my gift. So she asked for my birth date, you know, the whole astrology, you know, no power, all of that. And the Lord just gave me a picture of her as a young girl sitting in a room lonely and abandoned. I just, just spoke that to her and said, you know, the love of the Father is here today to minister to your loneliness. She literally dropped the, the, the uh, notepad and ran in the bathroom crying. My wife looks at me and says, we didn't even order the food. You, ju you know, just, I mean, it was one minute, five minutes, ten minutes. She never came back. All I knew how to do was leave our church card and a hundred dollar tip. Fast forward to Easter Sunday. We're sitting there and the brother is literally preaching like, you know, hellfire and brimstone. Okay, like I'm crying in the front. Oh, God, I don't love you enough. No, I'm not ready to. If a man came in or the God, and, you know. And he's just, I mean, he's going wild. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman in a beautiful white dress come in the back. And it was her from the restaurant. And when he gave that altar call, folks, she didn't walk down to the altar. She ran. <laughs> you know, we prayed for her. It was incredible. And then I went home and God gave me a spanking. He said, don't you ever do that again. I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, Jeremiah, are you so wise? Do you know my Holy Spirit so well that you think you can determine who I can touch and who I can't? You know, a fiery preacher or someone comes into town and you have friends and family. Oh, that brother's too deep for them. He's too Pentecostal. They'll be weirded out. Are you God? That's what the Lord was saying to me. Are you God? Don't ever do that again. Don't ever put yourself in a position where you think you can dictate and you can determine what I can do and what I can't do. See, when doorkeepers of revival come onto the scene, they recognize nothing is impossible for God. They weren't intimidated by a crippled beggar who had sat at a religious gate for 40 years. They were not intimidated. They engaged and said, silver and gold have I none. Some of you are, well, I don't have a sound system. I don't have a building. I don't have a PH. Listen, I got a degree and it did nothing for me, okay? If God tells you to get a degree, go for it. But listen, I want to encourage you today. I want to challenge you today. Follow the voice of the Holy Spirit. We need the fresh ruach, the breath of God to breathe upon a religious system in a church. And I'm prophesying to you, we've made it so much about the house of God that we don't even talk about our own personal homes. What if the revival that's coming to this nation, we're going to see his breath and, and meetings like this, but folks, I've been dreaming for years now, it's going to come to homes. It's going to come to neighborhoods. It's going to come to workplaces. It's going to come to elementary schools. God is looking for doorkeepers of revival in every sphere of society. You are not less than because you're not called to be a preacher. Lord said to me months ago, the most anointed individuals in this nation are homeschool moms. Come on, somebody needs to hear that today. 
If we can shut down when the Holy Spirit can move and can't move, I'm telling you, we haven't yet tasted Him. This is not turning the faucet on, God move, and then shutting it down. This is, Lord, we give you freedom, liberty to come and have your way. And if that means in this service, praise God. And if that means on my way home, stopping off at the gas station, praying for healing or deliverance, Lord, I'm all yours. I'm bought with a price. The Holy Spirit lives down on the inside of me. I'm tired of the religion. Peter and John are coming to the church. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 15, I'll begin to land the plane. Jesus had plenty of confrontations with the religious system in his day. Jesus probably being the ultimate doorkeeper of revival. And he confronts the doorkeepers of religion in his day, the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And I want to give you today, it's a little bit of a different take, I want to give you the religious tradition manifesto. I want to expose to you the religious tradition manifesto so you know how to war against it. I felt like this first session this morning, I need to expose the power of religion to you and then tell you there's a holy jailbreak. God is releasing from the power of religion and God is raising up doorkeepers of revival that are going to penetrate the religious system. Peter and John are coming to the church. Now in Matthew 15, Jesus begins to talk to the religious leaders and the Pharisees about their traditions. And I just want to remind us for one moment that there were approximately 613 commandments that they followed and another approximately 5,000 oral traditions that they tried to live by. So I know that there are those of us out there that feel bound in religion because you have to go to church on Sunday. Brother, I got free from religion. Tell me about it. Yeah, we went to church on Sundays and we had to give in the offering. What? 613 commandments and 5,000 oral traditions. I'd say that's a bit of religion. Just want to just sidestep real quick if this helps out somebody. Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you cannot inherit eternal life. What was their form of righteousness? It was fasting. It was giving. These in, it was praying. These individuals. So wait a minute. Jesus is saying, unless your righteousness surpasses that, what is he saying? When Jesus comes on the scene, he's not shutting down works. He's not shutting down fasting and praying. You hear these people, I've been freed from religion and now I'm in relationship, which means lazy, lethargic Christianity. I've been freed from religion and now I just do the little bit that I need to to get to heaven. When Jesus came, he wasn't addressing so much the fasting and prayer and giving. He was addressing the motivation for why they did those things. They did it to be seen by men. So the power of religion invites you to do religious acts so that you can be seen by men where when the spirit of revival 
evil comes upon you, listen, you will do for love what you would have never done for duty. I'm actually telling you when the spirit of revival comes upon you and he gets you on the inside of you, you will do more for love. So it's not all Sundays and Wednesdays and I've been freed from religion. Beloved, when the spirit of revival comes, it's house to house. It's prayer. It's fellowship. It's the apostles teaching. It's a lifestyle. We need this revelation and the so-called relationship freedom from religion movement. You didn't get burned out because you did too much. You got burned out because why you did too much is what burns you out. Because when we do it out of our beloved identity, we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You don't have to separate one from the other. So I'm prophesying to you. I believe many of you have been surprised this weekend. Wow, they're intense. I bet that's emotionalism. I thought they were in revival. I just thought it was knowing what you're finding is in this house. They're more intense. They're more hardworking. They're more fasting, more praying. It's not born from religion. It's born from an encounter, a sustained encounter with the burning man whose name is Jesus. And when he wraps his arms around you and fills Fills you with his love, you will never go back to dry, dead, stale religion. Come on, somebody give Jesus a shout of praise. Peter and John are coming to the American church. There's a holy jailbreak going on in America, and he wants to mantle you with revival today. You guys okay with this? Are you following me? I've always wondered. Jesus says, he reads the scroll, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the good news, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives. I've always thought that would have been a much, that the Sermon on the Mount would have been a much better location for that sermon. Why not go on the countryside with a bunch of lost people and say, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the good news, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. He doesn't do that. He goes into the synagogue, the church of his day. What is he saying? There are captives to sin, and then there are captives to religion. Jesus Christ is coming to his church saying, I've come to set religious captives free. Those of you going through the motions, miserable, depressed, more loyal to a denomination and a ministry than you are to the Holy Spirit. We need to ask for a spirit of repentance. I'm telling you, the doorkeepers of religion will guard that door just as tightly as the doorkeepers of revival will. You ain't going to go in there and mess up their show. They're out to produce Jesus. We're here to introduce them. They're trying to put makeup on them and do a PR job on them to make them palatable so that people can swallow Jesus. Come on, how many of you know Jesus is way too big to be swallowed? He's not some guy up in the sky desperate for more followers. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the bright morning star, the Alpha and the Omega. He's looking for more lovers, lovesick warriors. I want to 
encourage you, avoid the extremes. It's like you're seeing in these camps, you know, they did religious works, and so now, you know, they soak so long in the glory, they become a prostitute. And then you got people that are so into works, it's like, man, are you doing that for love or from love? But you know you don't have to, he loves you. The Lord wants to marry these realities in Christ Jesus, created to do good works. We will do for love what we would have never done for religion. I remember struggling so desperately to get to morning prayer. Like, I knew I needed to go as a pastor. Like, that's part of it, prayer and the word. Of, like, I knew but I remember that encounter that I had where the father said to me, Jeremiah, I love to hear your voice. And all of a sudden, it went from trying to make another prayer meeting to me waking up before the alarm hit because I, I couldn't wait to spend time with dad. When, when we allow him, there's, there's just such a, a deeper encounter that the Holy Spirit has for the church. I look at so much of what we've done in America. I don't know if you remember David Young Cho, you know, his mega church at one time, you know, over from Korea. He sends a delegation over to the U.S. back in the early uh, 80s and 90s, you know, as we were blowing up, you know, growth and all this stuff. And he wanted a report. They visited a lot of churches. You'd know the names. And they come back, and here's the report. We are amazed at what the Holy... Excuse me. We are amazed at what the American church has accomplished without the Holy Spirit. I look at what we've done in America and think... Thank God for what's happened, but what would the church, the bride, truly look like if we yielded to the Holy Spirit? What would mom and dad and brother, what would the home look like if we said, Holy Spirit, have your way? What would our churches look like? What would leadership look like if we stopped following church growth textbooks and human reason and, and health coaches? What would the church look like? Bob Jones came and visited me several years ago in a dream while he was alive. And in the dream I saw Bob Jones, I thought it was interesting, Isaiah shared his encounter last night with Bob Jones. And I saw Bob Jones in this dream and I said, is that you, Bob Jones, you apocalyptic prophet, you? That's what I said. You apocalyptic prophet, you. And he looked at me in the dream and he said, boy, I'll give you an apocalyptic prophecy. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Now don't go there for the sake of time because I want to finish in Matthew 15 so we can jump in tonight fully into what I believe God wants to do. But in Galatians 3, Paul rebukes the church and he says, you began with the Spirit. Why are you trying to finish in the flesh? How many pastors and leaders and individuals, you were born again and you started following the voice of the Holy Spirit. It was fresh. It was exciting. It was an adventure. And somewhere along the line, you traded freshness for programs. You traded having to dig your own well. I remember being 18 years old, sleeping in a room with my dad, him in one bed, me in the other. The Holy Spirit came to me and said, Jeremiah, you've been digging a well of your father your entire life. It's time to go dig your own. 
Come on, how many folks in here are grateful for the well that you've been allowed to dig in, but you recognize today it's not about mom or dad or even whatever church I attend. I've got to begin to dig for oil in the secret place. There is a man who lives between the lines of Scripture. Again, I get in trouble because I'm not a big fan of the 365-day Bible reading plan. I know, get your tomatoes ready. <laughs> I think that's, that's a, a good suggestion, and if you need more structure, praise God. My problem is what happens on February 6th when the Holy Spirit falls on Exodus 32, and he says, read it for the next six months. See, folks, what we're talking about, I'm not preaching against structure. I'm preaching against life without structure. I'm not preaching against form. I'm challenging form without power was such a humbling thing as a pastor to come up with ideas in the church that God obviously was not breathing on and the more I just kept telling people to do it just because we were going to do it and they were going to get bored and dry and stale I had to stand up and say you know what I missed it is it okay for mom and dad to come up with a plan for your kids about what you're going to do and then you recognize the Holy Spirit isn't on it and you say, you know what, I'm sorry mommy and daddy missed it? Is pride contending against a fresh move of the Holy Spirit in your life? I feel the Holy Spirit here. You guys ever seen that old, I don't know who it was, an associate with Kenneth Hagin where he just gets up and says, yield. Yield. And the power of the Holy Spirit broke out for several hours. What would a life look like of yielding to the Holy Spirit, taking our hands off our kids, our services, our lives? I mean, what if what he breathed on is what the structure is? What if whatever God breathed on, that's what we did, and I'm going to keep doing it until he breathed on something else? Now, I know by experience, just pray he doesn't breathe too hard on your money. Because when God breathes on your money and he tells you to sow and keep sowing and keep, and you're like, oh God, it's, it's decreasing, it's getting lower, as if he doesn't know. But folks, when we obey the Lord, when we follow his voice, it releases supernatural joy and encouragement and excitement. God wants to breathe life into your spirit today. Isn't it so tragic? I'm almost done. Isn't it so tragic that there are millions in America who are done with church? And I've been crying with them lately saying, yeah, you tried church, but you never tried Jesus. They, 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 were, they never got an encounter. This is why you come into these environments and I'm like, my God, Pastor Paul, I'm, I, this, this is incredible. Do the people here realize how precious and how costly? If this is all that you knew growing up, you know, we killed off an entire generation of evangelists in the church. The evangelists, the soul winners, radical encounters set people free from sin. They sent them to church and then they rotted on the back pew. And so the evangelists stopped winning souls and put them and, and sending them to church. And what ended up happening is evangelists planted churches. And you know what happens when evangelists plant churches? The church becomes a mile wide and an inch deep because they're called to win souls, not anointed to make disciples. 
Hello, those are your mega churches in America. They should have never pastored churches. The shepherds of the flock should have been feeding the people on the knowledge of God. Not taking for themselves more Bentleys and five houses. How are we doing? Matthew 15, the religious manifesto that Jesus confronts. Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, And why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whatever shall, whoever shall say to his father and mother, anything of mine you might have helped by has been given to God. And I'll explain that in a minute. He is not to honor his father or mother. And thus you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your traditions. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And after he called the multitude to him, he said to them, Hear and understand. And he tells them, and then just lastly in verse 14, speaking of the religious leaders, he says, let them go, their blind guides leading the blind. Let me give you six points today as we close. I want to give you the religious manifesto. Jesus exposes it here and so that you and I know when we awaken the sleeping church and we make war on the religious spirit, we need to know what exactly we are warring against. Now real quickly, traditions and traditionalism. There is always more danger in traditionalism than there is in traditions. Traditions are the living faith of dead men. Traditions are the living faith of dead men. Many of you in your family, in churches, in denominations, there are things that you have always done. It's been passed down through leaders or families, that kind of thing. Traditions. Traditionalism is the dead faith of living men. The dead faith of living men. In other words, there are so many denominations and churches. There are so many lame beggars. They're just doing it. It has no life. They don't even know why they're doing it. It's just the right thing to do. Anybody ever felt that tension? where you always grew up going to grandma's house for Thanksgiving and it's a family thing and then you get married and your spouse says, nah, I don't think so. And you got to go to mama and daddy and say, you know what, we've got kids now. We're going to do our new traditions. How many of you know that doesn't go over real well? And for those of you that are saying, heck no, my kid ain't doing that. Let me expose to you there could be some religion in there. Because we love to talk about the new. We love to talk about the fresh. We love to talk about the spontaneous until it knocks on our doors. Right? We love the revival and awakening and hoorah in the house of God. What if it means telling your kid no and giving them more of a time out at spanking time? I believe revival could hit the charismatic church if parents would just learn how to disciple their kids. Doorkeepers of revival? How about mom and dad learn how to parent? Oh boy, we're almost done. Number one, 
Religious traditions create transgressions of God's commandments. Verse 3, traditions create transgressions of God's commandments. It has become a religious tradition in America in many ways to go to church. People just go to church. And because we celebrate going to church, we transgress God's commandment to have no other gods before Him. I could give you so many examples. We have celebrated the concept of going to church and being religious at the expense of actually following the commandments of God, which, by the way, say, do not murder. So if we're going to church and supporting politicians who support abortion, we are accomplices to to murder. Oh, I wish somebody get free this morning. Come on, do you love your church attendance more than the Bible, folks? We need a revival of the Word of God. Politics are not my God. It's allowed for double lives. Check, check, check. Go to church. Religious traditions, checking boxes, transgressing the commandments of God. Number two, traditions invalidate the word of God. There's this conversation Jesus is having with the religious leaders where he's saying to them, why don't your disciples wash their hands? He's speaking of traditions. And then he gives them the example because the law says to honor your father and mother. But they say, because I already gave an offering in a bucket, a tradition, I don't have to honor my mom and dad. You don't hear this scripture talked about very often, but you know that one scripture that talks about like it's, you know, you might as well be an unbeliever if you don't take care of your family. So many religious traditions that we've bought into that invalidate the word of God, the needs of people. Number three, traditions, religious traditions create lip service to God. I'm reading to you the religious manifesto that God is calling this house to make war on. Religious traditions create lip service to God. We've given into an entertainment spirit in the church. We're bored with a God that we really don't even know. With every head bowed and eye closed, which is not in the Bible, we allow people to give lip service to God privately when they shouted for Satan once publicly. Number four, verse eight, traditions create distant hearts. One man said the greatest distance to ever conquer is around 14 inches from your head to your heart. The difference between a doorkeeper of revival and a doorkeeper of religion is they have God down cognitively in their mind. Wesley called this mental ascent, but they're actually lacking a true heart encounter with the Son of Man. Number five, religious uh, traditions create empty-hearted worship. They not only create distant hearts, but religious traditions can create empty-hearted worship. He said, they worship me in vain. 
This wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, one hour in and out. The lame, crippled beggar wanted in a drive through encounter what Peter and John had paid for with their lifestyle. They had been with Jesus. They were in the upper room. They walked with Him. Religious people are just looking to do the least that they can do to get into the kingdom of heaven, whereas doorkeepers of revival dare to ask, what's the most amount of heaven I can have on this earth? Come on, folks, embrace the civil war this morning and know that God is blowing a trumpet in America. He is saying, come out from among them. You are not Babylon. You are a bride. And there's a bride who's making herself ready. There are friends of the bridegroom. Peter and John, I feel a fresh mantling and commissioning here this morning. Many of you, as doorkeepers of revival, God is about to put a little extra pep in your step. There's more of an exuberance that's going to come in your worship. There's more of an anointing that's going to come on your preaching because you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and fire. Come on, the only thing keeping you from another encounter is you thinking you already had it. And finally, number six. Hope this is helping us. Religious traditions elevate the word of man above God. Folks, part of the power of religion is that it makes people believe loyalty to man means loyalty to God. They are not the same thing. We have people so bound by denominations and ministries being scammed and pimped and wounded and hurt. And God is sounding an alarm in this nation. I'm raising up an end time army. I want you in it. Jess, will you guys come? I know this morning has not been the most fiery, the most it's been teaching, it's been word. But I believe that God wants to write something upon our hearts today. Where vision of Jesus is present, deep and continual worship will never cease. It's interesting to me that in many of these points that Jesus rebuked the religious leaders for, in many of them, it had to do with worship. One of religion's strongest attacks has been against the worship in the church. Notice in religion, they still preach the Bible, but the worship is 15 minutes and three seconds. Notice how we give religious or revival, we usually make time for the word, but we're going to shut down the worship time. We are in a house this morning where they have fought and they have contended to create a place where no one that walks through these doors will ever engage in empty-hearted worship. Lip service is banned in Fresh Start Church. There's no religious devils that have permission to enter this house. I want you to ban religion in your home. I want you to break ties with it in your, in your region. Come on, would you stand with me?
I believe that God, just give me one more minute. I believe that God has raised up Fresh Start Church as a prophetic sign to a nation. I believe that this house is mantled to wake up the sleeping giant who is the church and to make war on the religious spirit. I believe there's a sound coming out of this house that is piercing religious darkness. I had several dreams before I came here of this worship team of of Jess and the team. And the Lord has said He's very pleased. (laughs) At the sacrifice, at the hidden commitment that you've made. And I believe that the well that you're digging has been dug for a nation And there's rain that's going to come that's going to be a great blessing around the world. And as a prophetic sign of what I believe God is doing and what He's asked me to do, I saw a recording coming. I saw an album coming. And so I today am going to sow $25,000 into an album. Come on, we're going to break the back of the spirit of religion in this nation. Believing God has raised up this team. The lion of the tribe of Judah is going to roar in America. There's an awakening coming. Come on, somebody give God crazy praise in the house. Come on, let's just begin to pray in the Spirit. God wants to shift something on the inside of you today. There's a sound that's coming forth. God wants to mantle some Peter and John's in here. Some bold, courageous, intimate filled with the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I want you to run down here now. Come on, God is calling us to the front lines. Something is shifting and breaking in the heavenly realms. I believe finance can shift things in the heavenly realms. Come on, victory is the Lord's. There's a holy jailbreak. Victory is the Lord. Holy Spirit, come this victory morning. Victory is the Lord's. 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 I want to thank you so much for joining us today on the Watchman's Corner. I pray that the message that just went forth was a blessing to you, that you were strengthened and encouraged. We're going to go into a time of prayer, but before we do that, I want to ask you to consider sowing into the Watchman's Corner television program, the ministry of Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. We are impacting lives on a daily basis. We're witnessing salvation, miracles, and deliverance be the portion of this generation. There's going to be a prompt that's going to pop up on your screen. You can follow the directions. Be sure to check out our website, jeremiahjohnson.tv. Let's pray now. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity today to gather and hear what you're saying to the churches. We lift up every need to you, those that are sowing financially into the program. God, we just ask, Lord, for greater blessing to be ours today in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in the Watchman's Corner. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hey there, it's Jeremiah Johnson, and I have the privilege here today of having Becky Fisher with me, founder of Kids in Ministry International. If you've seen the movie Jesus Camp that launched in 2006, she was the lead role there, was nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. And listen, we're launching a brand new e-course called Raising Supernatural Kids. And we have such a powerful burden for grandparents and parents, aunts and uncles, that if ever there was a time in the earth where kids need to walk in supernatural power, it's right now. Becky? It is. It's like we've got to get out of the traditional Sunday school mindset and understand that we are actually to raise a generation to walk in the supernatural, not when they become teenagers or young adults, but we need to equip them now as boys and girls so when they grow up, they're already experienced and flowing in their calls. Amen, amen. Well, listen, there's practical tools there's prayer and impartation. There's lessons to be learned. We want to encourage you right now, register today.